are past that stage in your life. Gosh. <laughs> okay. So someone asked you, oh, define yourself. So I'm going to guess that some of you would say, oh, you know what? I'm a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm a student. I like math. Or maybe you're a mom. They say, this is what I have. It's like the words that people use sometimes to define themselves when someone asks them about themselves. So when people ask me who I am, so I, unfortunately I don't have parents anymore, but I was a daughter for a long time. I did a sibling, I think a pretty good sister. Here this <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a wife. I'm a mom. I'm a friend. I was introduced because I was a nurse I was, for a very long time. I now run a health club, a wellness, so I'm a wellness coach. I do yoga, so I'm a yogi. Um, but one way that I defined myself that changed 21 years ago, I became the mom of a special needs child. So I'm the mother of someone who has autism. And that has defined me in a way that I couldn't have imagined if I had never had Yosef. So Yosef is 21 years old and he's on the autistic spectrum. And when you meet people in the community who have children with any kind of unusual need, unique need, I like the word unique rather than special, but have a unique need, that parent defines themselves very much by that child. It doesn't matter what else they've done in the world or in life, that child defines who they are. And when I think about my own experience raising Yosef and the experience of many other parents that I've come in contact with, so her best don't forgive me because she's heard me give this analogy before, but um, I always tell this is what it's like. You're on a great big ship with everybody else in the community. And we're all in this ship together, and we go to the same schools, and we go to the same events, and we enjoy each other's company, and we eat potato cooked together on shops, and we decide what we're doing with our children, and we discuss many different things, and our lives are going on the ship. Now that doesn't mean that there's always smooth sailing on this ship. Sometimes we hit rocky waters, and things like in everybody's life don't go that well, then the waters calm and we feel back to ourselves again. When you become a parent of a special needs child, it's like someone threw you overboard into the ocean. And now you're in that ocean in just a little life raft. And your family gets thrown over there with you. And you all of a sudden looking around going, how did I get here? How did I end up in the ocean? And I look up at the ship and thinking, how come they don't notice up there? that I'm down here in the water. Don't they see that I am one inch away from being actually in the ocean? The only thing that's saving me is this life raft. And how come they don't notice? And I long to get back up there on that ship because it was very lonely for me and my family out here in the ocean. What happens when you're out there is that you meet other people also floating around on their life, on their little life rafts. People that you never would have come in contact with. And all of a sudden you have this like little community of people floating out there, sort of surviving out there in the ocean. And sometimes you look at those other people and you say, oh, you know what, their raft has a hole in it. And they're bailing out water and you're so happy for your little life raft. But you still long to be back up in the ship. And that's a little bit what I would say is where some of you come in, is to throw people, be up there on that ship and throw over something raft to throw some overboard to pull them back onto the ship. Being a parent of a child with unique needs is an extremely lonely experience. And you may see, you know, that either you're friends with the siblings or you know the moms or you know the dads or you see them in school and they look like everybody else. But I am telling you that it can be a very isolated experience, a very lonely experience, and sort of a heartbreaking experience. Um, I think I'm very blessed. I come from a very big family, a very supportive family. But as supportive as anyone's relatives are, and they are supportive, 
they sort of don't get what it is like your child can't do what everybody else does. So I don't know which you volunteer to work with people with special needs, they're going to be of all different ages. Um, so I would tell you that depending on who you're working with, there's the child you may be taking some time with. But don't forget about the siblings and also the parents who may also feel extremely lonely. So I remember, I'm a big shoe goer. Um, we were raised in the house of, we went to Shaw and Shabbos. Rain, sleet, snow, we went to Shaw and Shabbos. Um, and I never missed a Shabbos. I was there with my double stroller and all my kids, and it didn't matter. I, mean, I still think we were more Bible than Anna Postman, for sure. Nothing stopped us from getting to Shaw and Shabbos. Yosef stopped me from going to Shaw and Shabbos because I couldn't take him. He would go in the tantrum. He'd throw himself on the floor. He, I'd get there, and all of a sudden, in the middle of going there, he would just decide, I'm not moving, and throw himself on the ground, and we would not be moving. And many of you have ever, ever dealt with a two-year-old. You know two-year-olds can do that. But a seven- or eight-year-old is not a two-year-old. They're the size of a seven- or eight-year-old. So I would be, sometimes, I remember this, I was the I think, you know, but it was on Jefferson and Sussex. And I was walking with him, so he decided, I'd come, I'm not going any further. He threw himself down on the ground, and when he did that, he sort of tripped me. So I fell, and I ripped my pantyhose. Anyone knows what that experience is going to shore, but all of a sudden, the ripped pantyhose. It's just not a good experience. And my leg is moving. And the two of us sat on the ground on the corner of Rutland and Sussex, both of us crying, unable to move. And I remember the feeling of, Nobody sees me, and I cannot get myself off the sidewalk to get us back home. I feel that like a few moments in my career and in my life as a parent, but that was one of the lowest points for me, crying, bleeding, ripped panty bows in the west in the middle of the street. While everyone's getting their kids ready for school and getting ready for you know, Tobin, Yosef at that time was in public school because that had the best program for him. And it was, you know, it was right after school and it was actually Halloween time. So we actually had, he came home with a big pumpkin and he wanted a jack o' lantern in the first way. And my daughter, my daughter is an artist, and she said, Mom, we're just grown up. We'll make him a jack o' lantern. He wants a jack o' lantern like everybody else. So we sat and she cut out a jack for him, and I guarantee we were the only rabbinic family, probably ever, that around Halloween time had a pumpkin is sitting in their house. Are you with one? Okay. <laughs> 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 to Sinai, so we were able to make that shift, and he's able to have this Jewish education, and he's an incredibly spiritual person, Yosef. It's sort of interesting, because if you think about concepts that are extremely abstract, and abstract concepts are very difficult, in general they're difficult. Um, like think about math, I mean, those of your students, math is sort of an abstract concept. It's many of you may feel like, wow, I never got math. Um, but there are other things, religiosity, spirituality, you can't hold on to, you can't hold on to Ashbar, right? You can't grab Hashem. What's Shabbos? It's just a day of the week. How does someone who has no concept of, of, of abstract thinking understand Shabbos? But for some reason, this spoke very much to Yosem. He's very connected to Ashbar, in a way, actually, that I can't understand. He has intimate conversations with Akash Baruch Hu all the time. In case any of you had plans last Sunday and were worried about the hurricane last Sunday, that didn't happen, there was a lot of hype about that hurricane, and we had the most beautiful weekend <laughs> over last Sunday, you could thank Yosef. <laughs> because last Shabbos, he had a plan. My brother owns a house in Bradley Beach, and he very much wanted to go to the beach last weekend before the end of the summer. And we were telling him, I said, I don't think it's going to happen because the weather's going to be terrible over Shabbos. Over on Sunday, they're expecting a hurricane. He said, don't worry, I asked Hashem to not make the rain, but to make the sky beautiful. 
when we woke up Sunday morning and they said the thing had blown out to sea, actually, I did feel he had a big part in that. <laughs> I will tell you a great story. Two years ago, Sukkot, it was, you know, you know everyone will know what that's like. You build your sukkah, you get the sukkah ready, blah, blah, blah. The first night, it's raining. <laughs> you know you know how hard everybody worked. Actually, my husband calls sukkah a man's version of Pesach. That's what sukkah is. That, that's what sukkah is. And we come out, we're just about, we're standing outside, and we're just about to go in storms to rain. And literally, Yosef put his hands on his hips and looked up. Went like this, like, are you kidding me, Hashem? Are you kidding me? And it's not raining. <laughs> so we have a lot of great stories like that about him, whether you believe them or not, there are our family lore. But he has a tremendous connection and spirituality, as many children with special needs do. It's sort of an interesting thing that they do have this special connection and spirituality. So what does that do for you, people who might be working with children with special needs or young adults with special needs, is that you get to connect to somebody who may be on the outside, seem like they don't know what's going on, but they may have something that we don't understand, mm -hmm. a connectivity or something, and if you can tap into that and work with people with special needs, actually you will gain so much from it. So that's the positive part of that working with people with special needs. As far as the parents and the children, so my son is 21 years old. So we've gone, we've come from a long time since the time when he would throw himself on the ground or that someone would knock at my door and say, oh, excuse me, you know your son's on the roof? Mm -hmm. So that happened not infrequently. Or we have locks inside our house that locked from the inside because he would always be leaving. Well, he always was like Houdini. He would manage to find a window and get out but we would actually all be locked inside our house. The amount of times that I would be looking the neighborhood, searching the neighborhood for him. And uh, one time the police picked him up and he told me, oh, um, the policeman picked me up, mom, but we didn't turn on the siren because of the shockers. So it's been a long time since I had to deal with that. You know, so actually, with a lot of work, a lot of work, and a lot of love, and a lot of therapy. And a lot of just him and growing up. He's actually a very lovely 21-year-old man. So we've been trying to talk to him about the following concept. I want something. Now, what is it you want? Think about it for a second. What is it that you want? Right? And just think about anything that you want. And that you would say, this is what I want. Take one second and think about that. Got it? That concept of saying, I want something, most of us don't think about it. But this was actually something I had to teach him what that meant, I want something. So my husband and I were talking to him about that, that, that people have things that they want. And it's just like they have things they don't want. So he said, okay, I got it. He walked into the other room. And then he came back and he said, my husband, you know, Daddy, when you and Mommy go to Israel, could you tell Hashem that I want to go to Wanyu? He wants to go to college because that's what people who are 21 years old do. They go to college. And he's not going to college. Okay? He can't do that. And sort of like broke my heart, but that's not something I can do for him. And as people grow up, especially unique children are little, and then they're in elementary school, and middle school, and they go to high school. And then they become adults, and they are still unique individuals. Those needs don't go away because they become adults, and there are less and less social resources for them, and they're extremely lonely. And they don't quite get, where did all their friends go? Where did everybody go? Which is really very much where the young adults in the community, they can get involved in this project, and young marrieds to also work with people in the community who are not children, but who are college age and older, you cannot imagine the gift that you would give them now. So, you have a big job ahead of you about what it is you're going to do. The people, when you say that someone has unique needs, there are so many. Every person is unique and different and has special needs. 
Um, and the best place to find out about that child and who ends up working with them is to talk to their parents and their siblings. If they have siblings, siblings have a completely different perspective on that person than the parents do. My son, who's the closest in age to um, Yosef, wrote about being his brother um, for his application for law school. And he sees him as just his brother. He doesn't see him as somebody who is so uniquely different. So sometimes it's to get the perspective from a sibling who will also be helpful. So what does volunteering do for you? So actually, I've been writing about this a little bit. I'm doing some research on what does being a volunteer do for the volunteer. So tell me what you think. Why, why do you want a volunteer to do this? What? taking medication when you physically exercise. So that's one of the ways I'm going to tell you through life, make sure you're doing some physical movement. The other, which I can't help but I always tell people, make sure that you're eating correctly. If you eat too much junk food or too much sugar, it also has effect on self. 
I will also tell you when you're working with the young adults and little children that you're working with, I would avoid that one of the things that you do is give people a lot of chazarai. It ends up being something that happens very often. Usually, it's not good for anybody, but very often people with special needs in particular have, are much more sensitive and may be more sensitive to high amounts of sugar. So just keep that in mind, not only for them, but for self. And the third thing is how do you keep yourself kind of grounded? Or when you have a big tests coming up, or your work is too difficult, or there are too many things calling on you, how can you keep yourself just bring down your stress level. So I hope you'll take this little teeny journey with me. Okay. So if you don't mind, put both your feet on the floor. And just, and I know this may be a little weird for some of you who've never done it before, but just open yourself up more for me if you don't mind. Okay. And just take a deep breath. And exhale. And just for the next two minutes, we're just going to be present here. I'm not going to talk for 30 seconds. And I want you to see what silence feels like. We're going to ignore that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> in just 30 seconds. air comes in, it goes out. What happens to the body? You breathe in. Just note that again. Do it again. Inhale. Count. And on the exhale, count. This breath can be very relaxing. If you ever feel very stressed, it can be a two-minute holiday in the middle of the day to just calm down. When we care for ourselves, we are so much more well equipped to care for others. Self-care provides us with the vitality and strength we need to share our time, strength, and energy and gifts with those around us. Take a deep breath. Exhale. Open your eyes. And I wish you so much success on this new journey that you're about to take.